I just want to, before I start answering some questions, I just want to sort of situate myself in what I'm doing when I'm answering these questions. So the first thing is, is I'm an, I'm an expert on some things, right, or relatively speaking, but I'm not an expert on everything. So if someone asks me like a really clever question that I don't know the answer to, I'm not going to pretend I know the answer to. And on some things, I'm really not that qu quite sure. So I'm going to you know, tell you what I'm sure about, what I'm not that sure about, and then um, uh, if, if, I've, if I genuinely don't know, I don't know, right? You know. So the other thing is if people ask questions which I think aren't really on the point, I'm going to maybe answer a different one just to try and get the points across that I want to make. Um, so if you ask me some you know, esoteric question about whatever. All right. So the question is, is how do you message the re revolution to different groups of people? Um, well, you know, my, my radical answer to that is what I've just said in my talk, really, is you get up in the space you're in, you know, in the meeting or uh, on, the, on the internet, on your social media, and you start talking about revolution. That, that's, that's the piercing of, of the social space. In other words, instead of apologising and being depressed and, um, you know, going with the flow, you go against the flow at this stage in history. And through that, you start creating a counter movement. So an, an interesting example of this is like Extinction Rebellion. When we set up Extinction Rebellion, lots of people are going, oh, you can't, you can't, um, you can't use the word rebellion, you know, it's going to put off <laughs> the middle class and all the rest of it. And what we said is that's what we need. What we need is a rebellion. So we're going to call it a rebellion because that's what we need. In other words, this comes back to this idea of, of, of virtue orientation towards messaging, right? You're not messaging in order to get something to work. You're messaging in order to communicate the virtue, the rightness of what you're actually saying, which is number one, revolutions are inevitable. Number two, revolutions are justified, right? And number three is we need to engage in a pro-social, proactive revolution. And this is what, what it looks like. And here's a plan. And when you're communicating the plan, you're not saying, hey, you know, and there's a whole load of abstractions. You're saying, we're going to do this first, right? We're going to set up 10, 10 assemblies around the Paris area. This is how we're doing. I've downloaded this sheet of paper. I'm going to go on this Zoom call with these guys and we're going to do it. And when you get to those assemblies, you're going to stand up in front of these ordinary people and say, you know, you guys need to decide what you want to decide. But what I'm here to say is the French people need to have a re revolution against the neoliberal state because otherwise we're going to die or our children are going to die. That's my view. You need to make your own mind up. So you're not, you're not doing the, the defeatist thing of going, oh, you know, everyone can make their own mind up about things. We're just here to facilitate you, right? That's the old sort of horizontalist messaging. But you're not doing a top-down Leninist messaging of, I'm the revolution, you know, I'm in charge. You need to do this, otherwise we're going to break your legs or whatever, right? It's like it's, a, it's something between the two or something that transcends the two, which is this is me, this is what's going to happen, this is what I think about it, this is what I think you need to do, and you need to decide for yourselves what you need to do, right? So you get the respect of, of having that distance. You're not imposing yourself, but you're being honest and clear, and I think that's the optimal way of communicating what we need to do. And just as a little aside, like I was out in uh, inner city like marketplace yesterday and one of the people uh, I was talking to, you know, I was working with, she was talking to people saying, oh, we need a revolution. And she was saying like, loads of people in the market were going, oh yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do, don't we? You know, like what we need to understand is everything that we're being shown by the mainstream media about what's realistic and not realistic is increasingly a bubble. The ordinary people out there in the Western world, they're looking for something fundamentally different, which is why they're voting for fascist parties, right? Because we're not offering something that's fundamentally different. And we need to stop listening to all that, you know, oh, you can't, you know, you can't upset people, you can't say these sort of things. And we say, yeah, we can, and we're going to do it. And if it doesn't work, so be it, right? But that's that's who we are. Thank you, Roger. Next question that came in relates to what you opened with in terms of the article coming out this week about elections versus destruction. There's some confusion around the midst with the New Year's message in terms of building the new civilization, creating a balanced revolution. 
how does that fit in with uh, groups that already exist? How is this new uh, movement uh, for building a civilization, for building democracy, different to the transition towns uh, movement, for example, or the climate majority project, or yeah, these existing uh, independent candidate uh, solutions? How what are we saying that's fundamentally uh, different? In it? Well, the first part of the question is 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 this prob is this problem about if you want to build a new civilization, you know how that's culturally framed at the moment is is as a sort of intellectual masturbation project, right? <laughs> Which is lots of men of a certain age like me get together and hypothesize around what the future is going to look like in a way that's completely disconnected with the praxis of social struggle. Uh, and obviously that's self-serving because most of these men of a certain age talking about this stuff have no intention of putting their privileges on the line, right? Their status on the line. Uh, maybe they do in theory, but in practice they don't. That's one problem. And the second problem is they're not, they're not interested in the actual praxis of how change comes about. And this is a massive, massive problem, right? Uh, which is why I'm not like them, right? Because I go to prison and all the rest of it. Um, having said that, designing the new civilization is a massively important uh, intellectual task and it's something I'm very interested in. But what we need to do is to do both. And in, in fact, both need to be part of the same category. And this is what praxis means. What praxis means is not actionism. It doesn't mean, hey, we're going to do all these actions and, you know, push through all these demands through doing civil resistance. It means we're engaging in an intellectual project in what the future is going to look like. And the analogy is here is the Communist Party in the early 20th century, right? They had an action strategy and they had an intellectual strategy. And if you read people like Gramsci, as you probably know, they had this notion of the organic intellectual, which is someone who's on the factory floor, you know, talking with the, with the workers, part of their struggle, and is intellectualising about how a post-capitalist society is, is operating. Now, again, I'm not saying that what they were actually saying was right or wrong. I'm just saying, like, this is a mode of revolutionary organisation which optimises the probability of success, which brings together social struggle and this intellectual project of, about what comes next. Um, and it's interesting, of course, that people misunderstand that because when you start talking about the next civilization, they go, oh, you know, maybe Roger's just going to do nice podcasts from now on. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 that's just, that's your, that's your, you know, categorical prejudice that you think these two things are separate things. No, they can and should go together, which obviously then relates to things like the climate, you know, majority project or transition towns and all the rest of it. All the reformist like projects basically either explicitly or implicitly accept that there's going to be no social confrontation or social struggle, or at least that's subsidiary to this ridiculous notion that social change happens through persuasion and information transfer. You know, oh, if only the scientists, you know, gave better information, the elites would change what they would do. I mean, I've spent the last seven years trying to say to people, that's pure bollocks, right? As we know from, you know, the work of Martin Luther King and such like, entrenched power does not respond to reason, information or argument. What it responds to is material disruption of their interests. And, you know, that's why you have strikes, you know, as opposed to polite conversations and all the rest of it. So I think in terms of, you know, more broadly, and this is a really important point at this stage of development that I want to communicate to you all, is there is no point getting bogged down entering alliances with reformist organisations. Because what they'll do is at best like just delay things and at worst they'll sabotage uh, enabling you to put out that revolutionary message. I'm, I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, if you go to, mo if you, go to you know, most organisations and say, OK, you want to put a tweet out saying revolution is necessary and now we're revolutionaries and we want to bring down the neoliberal state. Like, no, no one's going to allow you to do that, right? Or you're going to get chucked out. Having said that, 
There is a, a minority, I think, of organisations around the Western world, particularly like local community organisations and organisations that uh, organise poor people or marginalised people who are well into this message. So it's not like not working with people. It's not some sort of purist ideological project I'm suggesting here. What I'm suggesting is it's an empirical decision, which is, is this organisation we're going to work with prepared to say that if this system is done, these people are going to kill us and we need a completely different system and we're going to engage in it through social struggle. If an organisation is in, into that project and that strategy, it's all systems go in terms of working together. If they want to hold back on that, then there's no point working with them. You have to go straight, direct to the people, to the people who are not organised and not go through the institutions. So it's a diametrically different strategy, what I'm suggesting, to what happened after 1968. So some of you may be familiar with this phrase, the march through the institutions. That's great when you know, you're in a reformist period and you're trying to accommodate yourself to an inevitable capitalism. It's, it's fine when you've got no deadline, you know, there's no climate crisis, you know, 1985, 1995. In 2023, it's an end of the world revolutionary strategy because of the objectivity of what the climate crisis is saying to us. Um, I've probably got loads of questions, but the question I popped in the chat to Robin was um, about um, your thoughts on the response of the British military. I mean, military generally, but the British military and the people behind them. Like, um, just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, OK, thanks. Um... I think the answer to that is is not to be binary around it, right? You know, like a lot of discussion around all this sort of thing is very simplistic. You know, on the one hand, you have the romantic revolutionary tradition, which is, oh, we're all going to surge forward and take everything over and it's going to be utopia. And then the sort of cynical, defeatist sort of paradigm, which is, oh, you know, as soon as you start causing a fuss, they'll come and get you, they're going to undermine you. I'm sure everyone's heard those conversations, you know. Both of them are, like, fundamentally, like, illiterate about how social processes happen. The first thing to say is there's nothing determinant about social change in the sense that it revolutions, like, you know, pro-social revolutions are not inevitable in that sense, but neither is it inevitable that the state always wins or the regime always wins. So there's, there's plenty of historical examples, for instance, where the military, at least the lower ranks of the military, join the revolutionary project or even are part of the revolutionary project. So sort of fascist examples where, you know, obviously revolutions are run by by the military and you get an authoritarian fascist regime. There's other uh, examples where they join in terms of a military conflict. And there's other examples, for instance, like Philippines in 1984, where the soldiers come over to the civil resistance project in a non-violent uh, uh, situation. So all of, those, all of those exist in the historical record. The question, of course, is how to maximise the real question, dare I say, is how to maximise the probability that people in the military, and you need to analyse that in terms of whether you're talking about the soldiers or the officers or the top brass, uh, are going to come over to a non-violent civil resistance episode and how you can maximise that probability. Um, and I think, I think the ways of doing that is obviously make, keeping it non-violent so that if there is violence, it has a tendency to backfire again. It's not guaranteed, but there's a high probability, let's say 50%. Um, the other thing is the framing you use, that the framing is bringing society good together. So you're framing yourself as society against the regime, as opposed to where a small bunch of revolutionaries are going to impose our you know, ideology upon society. So you're appealing to the frame of the conservative orientation. By conservative orientation, I don't mean people that vote conservative, right? People that are concerned about conservation. And obviously, like the military, many people in the military are concerned about the conservation of society in various ways that that can be, that can be framed. So it's quite interesting, as some of you probably know, that when, when Trump was going to 
you know, was trying to per pervert the American Constitution. Uh, apparently, American generals said to him, you know, our, our, um, our duty is to the Constitution, not to you as a particular president. So that's the sort of, that's the split that needs to be exploited or developed, as it were. And, you know, when I talk to the police, that's what I'm saying. You know, I had a conversation a little while ago and they said, oh, you know, we can't support you. We took an oath to the crown. And I was saying, exactly. You took an oath to the crown. You took an oath to the state. You didn't take an oath to the, the regime. The state is something different, right? That's organised society. Uh, uh, the regime, if that becomes uncons unconstitutional, then you're justified in terms of, of engaging in activities that will overcome the state. As John Locke said, you know, a 17th century philosopher, when a regime kills the people and undermines their, their livelihoods, then revolt is justified and it's also justified on the part of the military. So th those are the arguments as, 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 I, as, I, as I see it. And I think over the next 10 years, it will become more and more evident. You might think I'm being a bit naive here, but I do genuinely believe that over the next 10 years, it will become more and more evident to people on the conservative side of the spectrum that uh, the game is up for the sort of capitalist neoliberal regime and they're going to be looking for something different and it's up to us as historical actors to appeal to them and in a non-judgmental way so they, they join our alliance rather than gravitating towards the fascist alternative and I can't stress enough how important that project is and that's you know concretized by actually going to talk to these people you know having public debates with them um, and you know maximizing connection with them at all opportunities um, yeah 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 that's great thanks um, so sort of two questions there one's about you know saying this is a revolutionary assembly and uh, you know people coming into it going hang on a minute that's not for us <laughs> so obviously like this is an empirical matter right you can't get ideological about it you need to go out and see how it pans out um, and what I would predict is in most contexts most people are not going to walk, walk out not least because once you made a commitment to go into a room you're going to be pretty like done in by another person to actually leave it takes you know Obviously, the long tail might leave, you know, the two or three guys who just can't cope with what you're saying. And that has happened in assemblies. So as a matter of empirical fact, it's actually pretty unlikely that people will leave once they've actually come in. Having said that, you need to be really nuanced and clear about this middle way, right? You're not saying you are coming into this assembly and now you're revolutionaries or this assembly is revolutionary. You're not saying this assembly is revolutionary. What you're saying is, is I'm a revolutionary and this is what I think we need to do and this is what the organisers of this assembly think needs to happen. But you, as the assembly, make up your own mind independent of us because you need to decide what happens and that's the nature of an assembly. That's very different to saying you have to do something because this is framed as a revolutionary assembly. This is like the essential middle way or transcendent sort of way of doing it, which overcomes this binary between not giving any guidance, as it were, and then, you know, telling people what they're supposed to be supposed to be thinking. But like a lot of people criticise me about this, right? They say, that's not a proper assembly, you know, you're influencing people. But I'm like with this philosopher Foucault, as some of you know, this is a really quite important point, right? Which is there's nothing politically neutral about saying to people, you're coming in and you can decide whatever you want, right? The, the Fouconian or left popularist like critique of that is by not saying that we need to have a revolution, like basically pushes people into a neoliberal frame and they tell themselves the story that this assembly is just there for them to engage in some sort of reformist good behaviour because that's what they've been told to do. Well, if someone stands up and says, what we need, guys, is revolution. This is our point. Then you subliminally give the assembly the permission to imagine something fundamentally different, which subliminally is what they want anyway, but they don't have the confidence to speak it, which is what happens in 
neoliberal assemblies, right, which are organised by councils or by governments, everything is reformist. You know, here's this expert in river management, here's this professor. No one's actually talking about getting rid of the whole fucking thing, right? And if you don't say you can get rid of the whole fucking thing, then obviously people are less likely to do it. So I'm not saying that that critique is, is airtight, right? You know, the neoliberal sort of notion of objectivity has something going for it. But it's only one game in town. It's only one intellectual position. The other intellectual position has a lot going for it as well. And, the, and the, 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 it comes out in the empirics, right? What works and doesn't work. But I, inc you, know, you know, I've talked to eight to ten audience, right, in that last quarter of year. And I've said I'm a revolutionary and I think we need a revolution. And this is why. People aren't walking out. And going, they might have walked out in 2005. They're not walking out in 2023. So we need to, the devil is in the detail with everything that I'm saying like this evening because, you know, I haven't got time to go into it, which is why I did these 40 episodes, right? There's a lot of detail in there and the, de the devil's in the detail. The second thing is about Western society and, you know, I did half jokingly say that Scandinavian countries could get away with no revolution. But what I'm, what I'm doing there is being like a political scientist and saying, look, the revolutionary changes of the 19th century, you know, had big revolutions in Spain and, and France and Mexico and all these places. But in the Scandinavian countries, broadly speaking, and I don't know the detailed history, but I think it's fair to say that the transition to democracy didn't involve big civil wars or violent revolutions. And that's partially because those societies were quite advanced in terms of them being open and being able to make transitions quite effectively. So if you want a non-nuanced analysis, you could say, OK, the Scandinavian countries and highly democratic, you know, uh, evolved societies may, may, might make a transition you know, over two or three weeks of social disruption. Then you might have classical revolutions in the, in the gr countries in between, you know, France, America and places like that, US. And then in other countries, you might just have classical social collapse and the state collapses, you know, in societies which uh, have only been formed in nation states for the last 30, 50, 70 years. So there's a continuum there. So when I say that revolutions are inevitable, I'm not, I'm not you know, that's a summary of a more nuanced position and obviously there's you know chance and variability in, in there and I'm not saying you know just to be clear who knows right you know Scandinavian countries are a lot less like self-confident in their democratic commitments uh, than they used to be and I don't think anyone in Europe should be in the least bit uh, surprised if fascistic radical right uh, um, uh, parties win elections over the next 10 years I mean all the evidence is there and we know why that's going to happen because the liberal and the left reformist spaces are going to impose the costs of the climate transition on the poor, on small business people, on farmers and it's not surprising that they're going to move to the right and that's, a, you know, that's another story, right? <laughs> but it's a total fucking disaster in my opinion. Um, what, this is why there needs to be a deliberative left populist force in European politics to actually produce a system change alternative to the radical right, you know, romantic, irrationalist attractiveness that, you know, I'm sure many of you know the psychology of that. So, yeah, that's my broad response to that one. Just uh, speaking on behalf of Group 7, I hope I've got the question um, right. Um, does Roger um, see the revolution um, as changing at a local level to prepare our neighbours for the climate crisis or is it something bigger? Yeah, so the important, the, the important point here is, is what I was trying to communicate in, in, my, in my talk, is we're, over the last 30 years, we've been cultured and cultured into thinking that it's one thing or the other thing, right? It's revolution, uh, um, you know, it's international revolution or it's local action, it's global action or it's local action. It's... it's um, assemblies or it's direct action, um, blah, 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 right? I know this is really difficult to sort of analytically get your head round, but the fact of the matter is everything has to happen at the same time, right? And that's concretized by breaking things down into iterations, like right? we have one iteration 
of local action which is synergized with national action. Once that's happened, that phase, then there's a um, investigation as it were, there's a debrief about that iteration and then you design the next iteration on the basis of it, right? When you do the local action, there's pathways through to national action. So you have your local assembly and one of the pathways is to go to the National Assembly. One of the pathways is to be involved in national civil disobedience, right? One of the pathways is to stand for MP and go to national parliament. When you're doing national actions, when you're doing a mass demonstration, then you're going to have an assembly and you're going to split everyone up and say, everyone in Devon, you know, go to that tree. Everyone in Devon goes to that tree and then they discuss what they're doing in their locality. So. The, the point here is not to focus on the local and national. What, what, what we have to focus on, and this is another sort of prejudice of our sort of an, atomized sort of analytical framework, is we're not concentrating on the nodes. We're concentrating on the bridges or the networks before the, between the nodes. In other words, we're not focusing on the local or the national. What we're focusing on is the design of the interaction between those two nodes. Right? What's going, to, what's going to amplify the local? How can the local amplify the national? How can the national amplify the local? It's a really different way of thinking. And, you know, a lot of people have a problem with it, but it's totally doable. And, you know, that's, that's the, the project. So when the Humanity Project's going around the country, for instance, it's saying, look, do your local assembly. It's really important. No one's doubting that for a minute. Everything, you know, lots of things have to happen at a local level. But we're feeding into the notion of system change, which is we're going to have a national assembly and then we're going to have an even bigger assembly, which is going to parallel the national parliament. And arguably then there's a global assembly, which is going to parallel you know, the UN. So that's, you know, the direction of travel, as you might say. Hi, hi, Roger as well. Um, yeah, so this is naturally the question that the group came up with. Um, this is just one that I thought of. But um, <laughs> what sort of... <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, the question they, that, that we came up with was, is there a starter kit set up assemblies in places? But I just thought I'd chuck one of my own in as well. Uh, but what role will art play in the revolution, um, an era of sort of revolutionary art? I just wrote my dissertation at the moment as well about um, May, May 68, and the role that sort of situationist ideas had in that. Um, obviously, as Rogers mentioned previously, was failure um, due to lack of leadership. But um, yeah, just sort of generally. Okay, so yeah, just just on the very a welcome practical question, thanks. Yeah, there is a starter kit uh, that humanities developed along with other projects around the Western world. So yeah, if you tick the box, you can get one and it goes through all the, the nuts and bolts, as it were. As far as the art in revolution is concerned, uh, well, if you're doing a dissertation, you probably know more than me, but you know, one of the reasons when we had various like long term strategy discussions in the UK, we were saying, you know, there's these four elements, uh, assemblies, uh, civil resistance, uh, culture and elections. The reason we put culture in there is it's a bit, it's often not understood that most political change doesn't happen through politics, it happens through culture. And what I mean by that is big events with artists and uh, communication which is goes through cultural formats, TV, um, uh, gatherings um, and, and, and such like. Um, and, you know, the classic example is 1989, you know, with various uh, playwrights and singers, you know, talking in Czechoslovakia to the people. And the reason for that, of course, is because artists generally in the cultural space generally uh, is not as is not as uh, baked in it's not as dependent uh, upon the mainstream as you know government bureaucracies for instance so they have a certain amount of freedom I mean that's not necessarily a case obviously in all situations but the main I think the main point here is is 
is again, what I'm trying to communicate to you all is it's not this rather than that, right? It's not local action rather than national action. It's not like, hey, we're going to have this art revolution, right? An art revolution on its own is going to be pure bollocks, right? There's loads of art revolutions in the Spanish Revolution, in the Russian Revolution, and they all got shot afterwards because they didn't get the political like strategy sorted out properly. So there has to be a massive element of artistic like explosion like there was, you know, in 1917 and 1936. And at the same time, there has to be a solid like push towards a new constitutional arrangement, for instance, right? There has to be a massive push towards a localization of the economy and da 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 da, right? So this is the challenge is is instead of thinking it's this rather than that, it's like bringing that together. And this is why I've say, I was saying there has to be a leadership structure or a control structure of the whole space, which is going to create a coherent like strategy, which is going to include all these different elements and bring them together, right? And this is what's been missing for the last 30 years and why revolutions and, and uh, re uh, uprisings around the world have failed is because there's no centre. Right. And our challenge is to create a centre that doesn't rep reproduce all the Leninist crap of the 20th century. Right. But it has there has to be some people that are going to say, right, that's the that's what's going to happen in the art sector. This is what's happening in the election sector. This is what's happening in the civil resistance sector. And there's five pages and it's, you know, it's top line stuff. And then people gravitate people in the grassroots or people in the system have what's called bounded autonomy, right? They can do loads of stuff, but they're doing stuff which actually focuses on, on the grander strategy. So for instance, all the art people, like in April 2019, get all the art people, they're going to go and do loads of arty stuff. They're not going to do it just anywhere on a festival. They're going to do it in the centre of London. So it will synergise with the political rebellion against, you know, the Tory government. You see what I mean? So things are coordinated in, in, in that way.